Hi, this is Shane Davis. It was late September 2005 when I visited my friend Merv Tirio in Vancouver to talk about his connections to Lotus Engineering and to the Lotus 15 in particular. Merv has a long history of being involved with motor racing and exotic cars in general, an interest which continues today. Here is what Merv recalls of his time at Lotus and the development of the Lotus 15. I feel fortunate that the uh, I saw the Lotus 15 uh, in conception. I saw it conceived and uh, saw it through the pregnancy and I saw its birth and a couple of its offspring, but by explanation, uh, I lived a half a block away from the works on Tottenham Court Road in North London, and one night about nine, ten o'clock, I was out walking, and the lights in the drafting shop above the showroom that you have pictures of, the lights were on, so I went up, and here were two grown men Frank Costin and Colin Chapman on their hands and knees over uh, great sheets of uh, index paper and Chapman was drawing in the front wheels and sketching in the bump and droop that was required and then Costin also on his hands and knees looking away the other way was drawing in the body, the aerodynamic body outline. So here were these two genius attuned. They were only going by reference number. And the other person would then draw in the body line and say his number. And that's how. So when they got to the rear wheels, and uh, Chapman had put in the bump and droop, and this, and then Costin did his outline. And Chapman, on his hands and knees, let out the most orgasmic groan because he had realized that this hip line was that of a beautiful woman and that was the conceiving. This was the 15 they were drawing and that was January. I think maybe March, the first chassis came along. Um, and then, as we were saying, chassis was set up on tripods, the motor was hung from a chain block and turned where it would fit within the chassis and then the motor mounts were constructed to hold the motor and then the trick, I think it was Willie Griffiths, a brilliant man, had vacuum cleaner hose to do the header pipes through the tangle of uh, pipes and then poured fiberglass down them and it set overnight and then you took that off and set it off to the pipe bender to make the exhaust manifold. But then Ian Jones, the draftsman, came in the next day and drew the blueprint of what had been fudged the night before and that's the way the cars were built. The recollection that I had was the hours you worked. And I think Frank Costin had the record of close to 90 or 100, 115 hour week that you sleep about every second night. But I had been on one of these and I was maybe in about an 80 hour week but was, I don't know, welding in a motor bracket on the first 15 something and had a cup of tea on the floor beside me and the can of paint and here came to about a half hour later, sitting there, realizing that I picked this cup up to drink and it was the paint. I had been painting the welded chassis with the tea. That's how <laughs> tired you can get. Now, is this when you were first hired by Lotus, or is that...? Before that 57 Earl's Court, about first week October, uh, and that was the time when um, I inquired and they said we'll come out 10 o'clock the next day and I had had one year of welding, acetylene welding at Vancouver Tech so I knew how to start an acetylene torch <laughs> and 10 o'clock the next morning I went out 
and they gave me two pieces of flat stock to butt weld. I could start a to start a torch, and uh, I continue. I was said, "Okay, you're hired, forty-five cents an hour, Canadian." I think it was two bob ten at that time. Um, but I started immediately. I just stayed and worked on, and it was then later that day that I'd been given this aluminum casting, this alley casting, and said, what's it for? And they said, don't talk about it, just heat it and put that spring shocker in it. And that turned out to be for the first elite, the first Chapman strut assembly for that elite for the Earl's, Cove, Earl's Court. And then uh, I continued on later that night over at the little Edmonton secret garage working uh, with assembling that first elite and that was brilliant after being fortunate to get a job and my head was swimming just even a bench and making floor pedals, foot pedals for the 11. But then that night to go, here was Coston, Mike Coston, later Cosworth with Keith Duckworth this is now over at the little Edmonton shop. All the gurus were there working free at night. Chapman was there, uh, Coston was there, Frailing was there, the Ford man who designed the first Elite, and two or three of these others, and I was in heaven to work overtime and into one o'clock in the morning assembling. But I digress, that's the Elite. Back to the 15, uh, and after, the body panels came, and this again was about, it had to be ready for a race the ne that day or the next day, and the two left standing were Willie Griffiths and I uh, on this first 15, and uh, body panels were on, and we bolted the wheels on, Willie put some gas in it, and he said, do you want to have a go? I said, wow, so here's a brand new car, the motor hadn't been started, I don't know that it had seat belts, we certainly didn't have helmets, but Willie driving, so I was the first passenger, and we went out onto the North Circular Road uh, around London, and at that time he did give me the thumbs up, which in those days meant, do you want to do the ton, the 100 miles an hour, and of course, <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> As I said, I don't think the car was an hour and a half on its wheels. <laughs> and down and round we went and came back. But it had to go to a race. And the story there was a seemed to be a typical Chapman con job, but a, I believe a Belgian uh, cloth merchant, a uh, Pierre Bircham, uh, put up the money before getting the car, said, I want something, Chapman said they'll build it. So Chapman raced that car at least two British races. Now Bill Colson will have the record of the first entries of 15s um, in Britain, but that broke a couple of times. I recall Allison had taken it out, Cliff Allison, God rest his soul, and uh, he came in and it was about a two inch square, 22 gauge vertical post between the lower front suspension and the upper front suspension. And that was why Chapman painted all his chassis that light green because when metal broke, you would see the black strip of the metal breaking. And the 22 gauge had broke, so it was my job to cut that out and put in a much heavier substantial piece, 20 gauge. So that's how Chapman built his cars. But Pierre Burchant, in my mind, got that car about June or July after it had been well tested and the chassis two and chassis three would be a much uh, more experienced chassis but the, the customer having, having um, be more developed, assembly. would it? But the, first race I was on and was with 15s and that was uh, June the 8th, 
1858, and that was the Rouen in Rouen, France. But here's Allison's old London bus that was maybe 30 feet long. Inside the bus was two 15s, no room for their bonnets, so they were tied on the roof of the London bus. We were going up a hill in France, and nature called, and Willie had to get out and relieve himself. So I, have, I nipped up the hillside and have this photo somewhere of the London bus bonnets on top, Willie leaning vertically with the bus at about a 20 degree slope on the road and Willie relieving himself. But the people racing in those days talk about the golden age of racing. The drivers of the bus were Graham Hill, Cliff Allison, uh, I never drove the bus. Uh, it was myself and Willie and I think John, uh, I've forgotten his last name, but there was about five folk left the works with the two cars. We prepared the cars still on the Dover Ferry. We were still assembling stuff um, and then slept somewhere, but then drove on into Rouen and I looked up this year, I believe Graham Hill on that race, June the 8th, uh, 58, two Mark 15s entered, Graham Hill came second, Cliff Allison I believe left the circuit, that was the only 15s I worked on prior to the June Le Mans, where, and now this really gets interesting, you have some photos there of the uh, May M A Y E T French garage where Chapman out of the way did the work on his cars, but Pete Lovely and Jay Chamberlain, uh, car 35, and I was the mechanic. And I reminded Pete this year, the middle of the night they had an inflated uh, tonneau, uh, like a an inflated bed to get some aerodynamics and I was sent out about three in the morning to knock on all the uh, tailors and dry goods stores and get a three foot zipper that we could zip and divide this tunnel that the driver could get in. But that all worked and we got it. But, and if I find it, I purchased a newspaper after practice on the Friday and the headline is Allison Dumont, Allison the World, because Cliff Allison had the two liter um, FPF Mark 15 and he set the lap record that day. And this was the newspaper Allison Dumont, he has set the record. But what wasn't known was as he came in on his uh, warm down lap, the little cork gasket around the radiator split and it peed all the water out mm -hmm. of the FPF 2 liter engine and the engine fried. Mm -hmm. And about 200 feet in his coming into the pits and everybody is running out to meet him, congratulations you've set the record Cliff is waving his fist, we've done it, and he's giving the signal that he needs pushing. So everybody runs and crowds around him and pushes him in. And then we're told that the only two liter engine in existence, or it might have been one back in England, had fried. The man that had set the record and got the newspaper headlines. As a result, Porsche took their engines apart that night and reworked them tighter and I think the records will show only they overstressed them and only about half the Porsches finished the race. Ferrari won it, Hill Jean de Bien. But Porsche, in the thinking that they had to beat Lotus, did not know the Lotus car was not operational. And so that was uh, Cliff Allison. Well, car 35 was the one I worked on, and I think Cliff was car 36. How many 15s were at the 58? I, do, I don't long. remember. Were there? Three max. Oh, three max. Three max. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, Innes Ireland and uh, uh, Graham Hill had one. And I remember the change when Hill came in. 
or the other driver within us if it wasn't him. But I remember on the pit walk, on the pit bench, as when it was Ennis's turn, he was doing leap ups, jump ups to get psyched up, and he leapt off that pit counter into that car and was gone like a shot. He was racing before he got into the car. That was uh, you were in the Pete Lovely pit, weren't you? Or was it just the single Lotus? The race pit? starts at four o'clock. Right. And. Uh, they had all got away and it was good weather, sunshine, till about 8 o'clock. And the car, the clouds, absolutely empty. And you have that slide that I took of the half-covered bleachers. People just doubled up and were back in the bleachers. And the rain was, it was absolutely torrential. Uh, and it was then, just during that, in this rain, Chamberlain was driving and under the Dunlop Bridge uh, he was it was his right front uh, nicked a Peugeot Renault something and he crashed and then that story which uh, the rumor that has come out that at about midnight when he crashed some French businessman having a glass of wine by the circuit saw the driver uh, Chamberlain was knocked out into the circuit and this man hopped the fence and went out and pulled Chamberlain off the circuit. That uh, picture on the uh, uh, poster is when I went down about 8, 9 o'clock in the morning and took a picture of the crashed car that was still there. Uh, I think that was my experience with 15s. Uh, after that, I went other British circuits, but it was with the 12, with the single circuits. Uh, See here. Uh, uh, and, and other, because there was about a dozen uh, mechanics, and you would work on a car, and the reason uh, that I think I had Lovely's car is probably I'd help build it. You knew, you know, they would leave a mechanic to build a car and then take it to a circuit, so it was sort of car and mechanics. But after that, it was uh, uh, mostly 12s, and then worked on that first 16, the uh, front engine Lotus 16, which is now, in these last years of historic racing, is beating, they finally got it sorted out after 40 years, it's beating in the F1 class hmm. historics. But, uh, so with the um, 15, that developed directly from the 11, didn't it? Yes. So how did Colin Chapman reason this? He knew that the 11 was fast and it was light and it was very maneuverable. So he developed the 15 with those principles but made a larger car? Uh, in between, the 11 with the FWA 1100 engine and then they uh, sleeved that down to the 750 that won the index uh, in 57. They also bored out that FWA engine, it was called the FWB, but it was a single cam 1500 cc. So there was a few of those went into 11s and um, this was just about the year, second year of disc brakes, and they were doing well, and it was then that reaching for something better that in January uh, 58, as I say, the, uh, the uh, conception of the 15 came out uh, that had the double knocker and Somewhere you could find out when Coventry Climax made that uh, double cam FPF available, that it would be sometime in there. Mm -hmm. I think Cooper was using it uh, the fall of 57. But it was as uh, materials came available, and you know, Chapman had this extraordinary ingeniousness of bringing together uh, the best and he had devised the Chapman strut in that October 57 Elite, but then the 15 had it. 
prior to that, the 11s all had the heavier De Dion tube for their independent rear end. Mm -hmm. But then uh, he devised that three-piece Chapman strut that only three pieces one, the axle kept the wheels apart, two, the shocker kept the weight on it, and then a, a trailing arm or a forward arm to the body gave the suspension. So he reduced the uh, sprung weight down considerably with that design, and so the 15 had that advantage. Uh, and then the larger engine. Um, And it, the engine in that was cantered, I think, at about 7 degrees something. Uh, the 16, the Formula 1, was a disaster because he sat the engine over at about 30 or 40 degrees and cantered it, brought the shaft beside the driver, and it was just the universals were taking too much power. But uh, a brilliant man, a brilliant, innovative man. And uh, I just, last year, 05 Britain bought the Chapman book that was not authorized but called The Wayward Genius and that's about the talent the man had. He could bring together all the thinking of other people. People thought about it, said it can't be done. Chapman brought it together and did it. Uh, so uh, he had that ability. So the 15 developed to a larger engine and it, it grew to two liters, did it not? Yes. Started out the one and a half liter and then uh, as components, as I say, metal tubes were taken from 22 gauge to 20 and maybe for the two liter he made it 18. But uh, you, that's development. And that's why Lotus is world renowned. It had that ability to uh, bend the rules. It was interesting, a little vignette uh, in going through scrut scrutineering for the uh, 58 Le Mans. The scrutineers, the French scrutineers, got required that all the Lotus cars entered had to be in one spot at one time and all had to have tops. Because the previous year, and I'm sure you know the story, all the Lotus cars only had, you only had time to make one top. So he put the cars in one at a time, put the top on it, put the car in the garage, ran back, put the top, put it on the next car, and that was in 57. And those are the uh, Dodges. The man was, another thing with Lotus 12, the single seater. Uh, I think it was Aintree. The cars were numbered 15 and 16 and Hill was driving one and Allison was driving the other one. But when we went out for practice, took it up from Hornsey to Aintree, uh, only one car was built. And so the rest of them uh, were working furiously to build the second car. But one car went out, practiced, Allison in it. Mechanics all crowded around. One guy peeled off the five, stick them on thing, put on a six, and we fueled it, and the other driver went out in the second car, which was still being built at the factory. <laughs> so both cars on Saturday practice had qualifying times. Mike Coston, about one or one thirty in the morning in Hornsey, put the second car on the trailer, towed it out to Aintree, and it was there, hadn't run, but was on the grid the next day qualifying. And I don't think they finished, forgotten. I think that was the race when Hill lost his brakes, and that he drove the rest of the race on gear shift, and came in respectable, without brakes, gearing into a corner. When he came in, he could not get out of the car. You lifted him out of the car, and he was carried over against a fence, and Chapman talked to him for about a half an hour. And that photo was in the dogwood, uh, the doghouse 
in Silverstone, somebody had taken a picture of Chapman on his knees talking to Hill. That was the fiber those guys had. Just hmm. incredible. Superman. Yeah, regarding Pete Lovely, Shane, uh, I did. Did not know of Pete Lovely's 15 out here. I think I was still in Britain. Uh, Vince knows much more about that, but the Pete Lovely story I have, Pete had to buy that car. I understand that Chapman did that again. Give me the money, I'll build you a car, you can race for the team. The incident I graphically remember, and it was noon hour, I just had lunch in the pub, and I was walking back to the works. And to give you the incisiveness of this man, Chapman, nobody had the balls to call him Chunky to his face, that was his nickname, but he was walking from the office and was about four paces from me as I was walking and we were going to pass, I was going back to the works. And he said, you're from the Northwest, what do you know about Pete Lovely? And as that he passed me and I said, Mr. Chapman, he is brilliant and he will fit in your cars. And that was it. Chapman had found out what he wanted to know and Lovely since has said that his uh, eligibility to race for Team Lotus was he had to buy a car and Vince knows more. There are photos around of Lovely. Uh, he raced uh, along with Innes Ireland, I think, uh, in a formula car. I don't know the rest of that, but uh, Lovely uh, did very well. And uh, Lovely thought that after that rain in Le Mans uh, 58, it was insane to can you. He said that he told Chapman to take us out of the race. He said, this race is insane. So uh, mm -hmm. you can go to ask Lovely about that. He was there. But mm -hmm. that's my stories about Peter. Thoroughly enjoyed Vince suggesting we go down uh, to that fabulous 50s in Los Angeles last December. That was brilliant. That was when uh, Lovely was inducted into the fabulous 50s. So that's my story about Lovely. Perhaps a few facts about the Lotus 15 are in order. The 15 was built from 1958 to 1960. 27 cars were constructed with the first ones carrying the one and a half liter motors and the later ones the two liter motors and then the two and a half liter motors. The 15 had a space frame chassis with independent front suspension utilizing wishbones and coil springs. Coil springs were also utilized at the rear with Chapman struts. The overall length was 11 foot 5 inches with a wheelbase of 7 foot 4 inches. With its aluminum body, it was very light. Several cars carried different motors, but the factory motors were Coventry Climax. It was the last of the front-engined Lotus sports cars built by Colin Chapman. Factory drivers such as Graham Hill and Cliff Allison drove their 15s with great style. The Lotus 15 was indeed very fast and very maneuverable. Here we see Cliff Allison in his Lotus 15 during the 1958 British Empire Trophy race at Oulton Park. Several Lotus 15s were exported to the west coast of North America. Jay Chamberlain is seen here at speed. When the Westwood Circuit opened in British Columbia in July of 1959, it was a great day for the Lotus 15. Pete Lovely won the main event in number 125. Through the years, other drivers such as Pat Piggott, Lou Florence, and Ralph Ormsby raced 15s at Westwood. They were always exciting to watch. There has always been the need with race drivers to go even faster. Some Lotus 15s had bigger, more powerful motors installed, such as this Lotus Buick. In recent years, with the popularity of vintage racing, 15s are campaigned in many countries of the world. Of course, development has improved the reliability of the Lotus 15 and also improved the speed. In 2002, 
I was fortunate enough to attend the Goodwood Revival in England. Here we see car number 31 in the paddock before it takes to the track. This year is 2008. That is 50 years since the inception of the Lotus 15. I asked Merv Tirio how his days at Lotus had affected his life. Here is what he said. I think uh, that ability to stay on one's feet and uh, work when dog tired and was just when I then started the business I had an apprenticeship with how to uh, live without sleep. <laughs> Thank you. 2008 marks the 50th year of the birth of the Lotus 15. Celebrations of this remarkable event are well in order. Many thanks to Merv Tirio for sharing his memories and experiences of working at Lotus Engineering.